Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Rick Steves Tours Festival of Europe. I'm Lisa Friend, and I'm delighted to be your moderator this evening as we explore the back roads and countryside of Italy. Now, on behalf of the 4,300 households that are with us tonight, please allow me to introduce our tour guide for the evening, Rick Steves. Hello, Rick. Lisa, thank you very much for the good introduction, and I sure appreciate our whole team at Monday Night Travel here. Of course, this is the Monday Night Travel kind of format. We've been doing that for 100 Mondays, but this is a very special month, and every evening from what? From January 10th to January 30th, we are hosting a travel special, a travel festival, right here, 9 o'clock Seattle time, our six o'clock channel time, nine o'clock East Coast time. And you know, it goes back to our passion for all the friendships and the people that are connected with our tour program. You know, for, for 30 years, we were inviting people to Seattle to have this festival. In fact, let me show you some slides from the festival. And, uh, and now we've decided to do it virtually so everybody can come. It's one of these little bonuses we get out of the technology from our remote working during COVID and so on. But for 30 years, we would rent out the biggest venues in our little town and we would invite all of the people who took our tours the last year to have a reunion. We'd fly our guides in from Europe and we'd get together. We had like five, we had a couple of thousand people that would come to town. It was all hands on deck. It was so great to get the, the gang back together, this messing of the scrapbooks, to meet the guides and to kindle our travel dreams and decide where we're going to go next year. Well, what we were doing also during that alumni party, of course, was presenting our next year's tour program. And we had a parallel sort of event called Test Drive a Tour Guide. And we would have every venue in town very busy with our guides who flew in from Europe giving talks about their country. We're doing that now over 30 nights with this January travel festival. We're doing it virtually. And that means people from all over the country can pop in and be part of the party. I wanna remind you, we're selling tours. That's our main thing here with my 100 colleagues at Rick Steves Europe. And we're also just inspiring and equipping people to travel on their own. So when you look at this next hour together with our friend from Orvieto, David Tordi, we're gonna to be talking about our tours, but I wanna remind you, you can certainly just get the guidebook and do it on your own. That's what these guidebooks are for. And that's one of my great joys is putting the practical information together so you can just grab that guidebook and turn your travel dreams into smooth and affordable reality. I love nothing more to see somebody grab a guidebook these folks here are in Naples and they went to the Italy book and what they did was just found the Naples section and they broke the spine of the book and then they ripped out those pages like this and they were with the information in their pocket. It seems a little brutal to rip up a book, but hey, they've got a wonderful travel adventure. They've got the information right here and they're putting that information to good use. I'm so committed to this idea that if you equip yourself with good information and expect yourself to travel smart, you can. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. We don't want bland travel. Some people put up with bland travel, but there's nothing bland about the travel adventures you're gonna have when you travel either with our material as your own guide or when you join our merry band of travelers. These are our guides right here. We've got 150 amazing guides, most of them Europeans. Imagine the opportunities to travel with these great travelers. And that's what we're doing this month. And that's what we're doing all through the season this coming year. We've got a thousand tours scheduled, 40 different itineraries. I would say we've sold 25,000 seats. We've got 30,000 seats altogether. That means a lot of the tours are sold out but a lot of the tourists still have seats available. There are thousands of seats available on those thousand different departures. Tonight, we're gonna to be talking about Italy's countryside. I do wanna remind you seven days ago, we talked about, or five days ago on, the, on Tuesday the 10th, we talked about Italy's cities, Venice, Florence, Rome. Like every one of these events, it was recorded and it is um, saved here. And you can go to ricksteves.com in the same place where you sign up for the uh, upcoming uh, events from this festival. You can watch recorded versions of the ones that we just did. All of these will eventually be recorded and on our website for you to watch anytime you like. 
Tomorrow, we're having a, every Monday, we're having a Monday night travel show, and every other night, we're having a country focused show. Tomorrow, we're talking about the irreverent history of Rick Steves Europe, way back from our Europe through the gutter days. Then we're going to go to Portugal with Christina. We're going to go to Scotland with Cullen, and we're going to go to the Czech Republic with Katka. We've got lots of great shows coming up. I also remind, want to remind you that every Monday, we're going to be having a digital drawing and giving anybody who entered in the week before, uh, uh, one person, one family, or one, one, one traveling, one traveler, uh, their choice of a free Rick Steves tour of our favorite cities, London, Paris, Rome, or Istanbul, a seven week tour for free. That'll be happening tomorrow. So if you want to tune in for that, it's going to be a lot of fun and you will get, um, an email that will explain to you how you can, um, uh, put your name in the bucket, the virtual bucket, or you can just type in ricksteves.com uh, slash giveaway and enter that tour right away. All the details are available on the website or if you go to that uh, URL I just mentioned. Also, I want to remind you, anybody signing up during this month gets $100 off on whatever tours they book. Hey, we're going to be talking a lot about Italy, and David and I cannot cover it all on a, our uh, presentation. I just want to remind you all the information is there in the various books that we have written. We have 40 different itineraries. Here you see our spaghetti map with all the different itineraries we do. The biggest pile of spaghetti there, obviously, is in Italy, and that's what we're going to be talking about now. We've got, what, five different tours or so about Italy, and, uh, you know, this is our best of Italy itinerary. I'm going to take just a minute here because once we get into the actual travel information, we won't be referring to specific itineraries, but uh, you can look at these itineraries and then realize what experiences go on what itinerary. But this is our idea of the best 17 days that Italy has to offer. Flying into Milan, you go about an hour north to the beautiful little town of Varena on Lake Como to get over jet lag. It's a beautiful two night stop and you meet your guide and your bus and so on. Then you go over to the Dolomites, the Italian Alps, then Venice, then Florence, stopping in Pisa, go to the Cinque Terre for the Riviera, head on down to Siena for your dose of hill towns in Tuscany, go to the town of St. Francis and Umbria, and then finish with a finale in Rome. That is an amazing 17 days. And I want you to notice there, every stop is two nights. We do not like one night stops. We try to minimize those one night stops. It's good to be situated. This is a parallel look at Italy. That's none of the famous stops. It's all secondary sites where you're going to be more into the village and the rural and the and the intimate details are, are slices of the culture and the cuisine. I, I took my family on this tour and it was just a wonderful tour. Uh, and this is Village Italy. So you'll see a lot of images from Village Italy uh, in this next hour. If you don't have 17 days, uh, you may have nine days. This would be the best of Italy in nine days, I would say. It's a great variety. You got Rome for the the history and the ancient sites. You got Florence for the Renaissance. You got Volterra, my favorite hill town. And you got the Cinque Terre for the Riviera. So you got the art, the ancient stuff. You got Roman Florence, hill town, and Cinque Terre. That is a great nine days. Even if you're not going to take one of our tours, remember, you can grab these itineraries and do it on your own. That's what these guidebooks are for. These guidebooks are frankly designed so you can take our tour information and do it without us for do-it-yourself type people who want a little more independence and save a little money. Best of Tuscany in 12 days. I would love to take this tour. It's our one of our newer tours. We've just had it out for a year or two, and it is a delight. We'll be talking about that with David in a moment because David has guided this tour. And My Way Italy is about, it's about $1,000 less than the other tours uh, for the same amount of days because it is the structure of the tour without the guide and without the admissions. You've got the bus, You've got the hotels and breakfast. You've got an escort from our office who will make sure you're on track and you got your questions answered and you got the guidebook and then you do your own thing. It's great for people on a budget. It's great for people who are going to take it easy physically. It's great for families. It's great for more independent types that don't want to do a lot of things with the, with the entire group. This is a cool option, the my way approach to Europe. Okay, well, that's an introduction. And now I am so thankful to welcome a young man who has great taste in scarves. He's a wonderful musician. He's a good friend. And he is one of my favorite guides in all of Europe. David Torti. How are you doing, David? Ciao. Ciao, Rick. Sto benissimo. Ciao. I'm very well. Thank you. And you're looking good for three o'clock in the morning in Orvieto. Yeah. I, I sleep dressed up. 
<laughs> Very good. I just saw you a month ago. We were taking our uh, guide training tour through town and uh, and we had a great chance to uh, pal around with you in Orvieto a little bit. How are you doing in Orvieto with you and, and your um, family and your music? I'm doing great. Thank you. Uh, we're in the middle of the night now, but uh, everything's fine. I have my uh, mocha coffee <laughs> coffee machine. This is the old one, the very old one. So that keeps me awake for the for the Zoom talk with you and all of our friends. Everything's great. I have to admit, everything it couldn't be better. Hey, David, I'm drinking an Aperol Spritz. I got it right here. Got my little garnish. And uh, this is about half Prosecco. So you get your little Prosecco your, or any kind of champagne, to be honest. And you get your Aperol. And then that's kind of about 50-50. And then you splash in some soda water and you garnish it with a little slice of lemon. And you know what I like about this, David, is this is really the sort of the trendy, this is what the college kids drink on the piazzas in Italy, isn't it? Yeah, definitely, yeah. College students, any age, uh, spritz has become a national national drink, and now it's a big international drink, yeah. Yeah, I just love to go onto a piazza in the magic hour of the day. People are you know, coming home from work, the students are done their studying in their classes, and people are just out on the squares, the sun's setting, and you see the sun low in the sky, shining through 50 of these glasses on the square, and there, it's like little lanterns of, of conviviality and, and uh, joy and, and people talking and friendships, isn't it? Yeah. Definitely. I'm having um, mm. my homemade nocino, the walnut, a walnut liqueur that I made with my family a couple of years ago, because so, this is good for the night, you know, for the night talking. Okay. You know? Very nice. Well, chin chin, David. Chin chin. Salute, Eric. Salute, chin chin, David. everyone. Okay. All right. Well, we got some traveling to do, my friend. And um, I'm just going to share the screen here and we're going to go back into this slideshow. And I'm going to thank you in advance for helping us understand what we're looking at and take all of our friends tuning in here um, on a trip around Italy. So um, here we have, you know, the Mediterranean has a lot of famous corners and a lot of very touristy places. I fell in love with a little strip of the most rugged part of the Italian coastline, the Cinque Terre. What does Cinque Terre mean, David, and what are we looking at here? Cinque Terre means the five lands. It's five little towns on the cliffs of uh, the Italian Riviera. They're now a protected area and protected natural park. And these are, in this picture, you see two of the five. Wow. And you can walk to all five. It's a beautiful day's hike. Uh, sometimes the trails are washed out and you go on a high trail. Sometimes you just duck in and take the train. You really can't very conveniently get to any of these towns by car, but it, the trains drilled through the mountains. And it was, I understand, the first train in Italy uh, uh, drilled through the mountains after unification to help tie the, the country together. And uh, when we go to the area, the, the sort of the resort town of the five is um, Monte Rosso, no, R Monte Rosso, isn't it? Yeah. Monte Rosso, see, si. yes. And uh, this is the only place where you're going to find a lot of beach umbrellas and, and sandy beaches and good hotels. Uh, a lot of our groups stay here. And uh, I just love, be I was here with a group a couple of years ago. I just love getting people oriented uh, on the walk, going to the restaurant for dinner because the next morning they got some free time and they'll just feel like they own the place. Isn't it a beautiful place to have a little vacation from your vacation? It's amazing. It's just a perfect space. Oh, I love it. And uh, when you're situated in whatever town you are on the Riviera, you can get from town to town by hiking, by taking the train. It's just five minutes between the towns by train. Or if it's not too wavy, you can hop on the boat. And uh, it's a little bit um, nerve wracking for a few people that are nervous about heights to walk across the gangplank there. But it's a beautiful cruise to see the five towns from the Mediterranean. And it's a fun way to get from town to town, isn't it? Yes. In this picture, you can see an elevated um, highway bridge. That's the road that connects all the Cinque Terre. But then at a lower level, you have the train system. And at the lower level, you have the boat system. So it's an it's an incredible uh, system of, of transportation and it's very easy it's very it's like a subway the the trains are like a subway system and the boats are a slower subway yeah. system it's just perfect the train is the no-nonsense way to get from town to town and five minutes on the train you see this tunnel here on the lower left you get to my favorite town of the Cinque Terre and that's the Veronazza each of the towns has a castle each of the towns is surrounded by vineyards and terraces that go back centuries and as you mentioned the whole area is now a national park so nobody can change any of their buildings look at this town here there's not a single new building in town and that means the character is just uh 
uh, you know, um, permanent. And uh, to sit up here on the castle and have a nice glass of uh, dessert wine or to sit here and have a wine or, or to have a dinner on the harbor, just a beautiful experience. Do your shopping. And then there's some good cuisine on the Cinque Terre. A number of things are famous from this area called Liguria. What are the taste treats we want to be sure to have, David, in the Liguria area? You're making me hungry at 3 a.m. <laughs> in the morning. Oh, baby. <laughs> this is the gesture for wow. This is delicious. And that's, um, that's a beautiful photograph. That's an appetizing photograph. What are we looking at there? This is pasta with pesto sauce. Pesto was invented in the, in the region of Liguria, where the Italian Riviera is. Yeah. Is and the, and the, the, the pesto is actually kind of perfect for the sauce, isn't it? Yes, it's perfect for this kind of pasta. So this kind of sauce together with this kind of pasta match perfectly. And as you can see, you just scoop up a couple of pieces of the pasta and the sauce just stays with the... Oh, with the so pasta. if you're going to be in the Cinque Terre, you're going to want to have the, the pesto because that's its birthplace, really. You're going to want focaccia because that's typical of this area. Yeah. And uh, seafood. And what else are you going to want to be sure to have? Among the seafood, I love uh, the, the Ligurian anchovies. They have incredible ah. anchovy dishes. Yeah. Achuge. My favorite, my favorite romantic uh, sort of vision is on the waterfront at midnight, looking out at the inky dark Mediterranean and seeing the lamps of the boats disappear between the waves from out at sea, knowing that the fishermen are out through the midnight hours with their big lamp attracting all sorts of little fish and scooping them up. They'll be in the market in the morning and they'll be on my plate that next night. That's correct. Baby, that's really, oh my goodness. I just love it. Beautiful situations like this. What a romantic spot on the Cinque Terre. Each of these towns has this kind of great ambience. Part of the reason it's so great is because it's a national park. Nobody can build any comfortable hotels. So it keeps away the most obnoxious slice of the traveling public, people who insist on good hotels. They're all complaining about the prices in Portofino and the traffic mm -hmm. jams in Porto Venere. And we're enjoying rustic Italy here in our own little hideaway towns, the Cinque Terre. You walk a little while farther and you get to Manarola. What a delightful town, these beautiful pastels. And the trails are just incredible. Do you like to go? Tell me about walking in, in the region there from town to town, David. Yeah, so among these five towns, there are these hiking trails, the official trails of the Cinque Terre. You just buy the card for the day, and then you can hike anywhere you want. I usually choose um, a, a leg because uh, when I have a, a free day there, sometimes I want to hike, sometimes I want to boat ride, sometimes I want to just you know lay on the beach and swim. When I decide to hike, I choose two towns and I, I walk the leg in between. And then yeah. there's unofficial trails also that you can take. It's all, the whole area is rich of beautiful trails, panoramic views like these. Look at that. Imagine that coming into a town like this, walking through the vineyards, seeing the, the, the artisans, uh, well, the, the farmers in the fields tending their grapes and rebuilding the old terraced walls. That's a lot of work. Dropping into a, a monastery or a church, checking out the cemetery, which has the best view in town, really, way up on the hill overlooking the town. Yeah. I met this guy, this beautiful brother, and he invited me into the abbey to try his homemade lemoncello. I've even got a bottle of limoncello here if I run out of my Aperol spritz. Uh, but uh, if, I, if a monk, if you meet a brother at the Abbey and he invites you to come into the Abbey and have some of his homemade lemonade or limoncello, what's the answer? Go ahead. Go ahead. Follow the brother. <laughs> Follow the brother. <laughs> I, I want to remind people that, and David has helped us with our with our shooting. I've I've got I'm so lucky as a TV producer to have friends who are guides all over Europe that'll help me out when we're doing our work. But we've got 18 shows on Italy, and they're all available for free, just to click away if you go to ricksteves.com in the TV section. I'm saying this because that's nine hours of information for planning your itinerary. Every one of the shows has a script there. Every script is annotated with details about how you might want to do the sightseeing around the things you see and we're interested in in the show. So here we are in the Cinque Terre filming, but that's just a reminder to you that we have 18 half hours on Italy, not to mention our new series of six hours of art, which much of that is in Italy, of course, also. Uh, so take advantage of our TV work as you are planning your trip. A very important uh, uh, site on our, our thing on everybody's list is uh, Pisa, and you have the Piazza of Miracles. It's more than just the Leaning Tower, isn't it, David? Oh, yeah. 
This is much more than the Leaning Tower. Leaning Tower is a unique feature, but um, this is Piazza dei Miracoli, the miracle square that mm -hmm. gathers the outstanding Duomo of Pisa, um, the dome, the baptistry, and the Leaning Tower as part of the complex. And this beautiful grass parking uh, park area where people, as you can see, enjoy their time. That's some of the nicest grass in Italy, I would say. I mean, when you think about it, what a place to just relax and you're surrounded by this amazing architecture. This is called Pisan Romanesque. That's a couple hundred years before Gothic. That's, That's this, this is amazing architecture. And of course, you've got the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Is it leaning this much yet? Uh, not yet, but in a couple of hours it might, yeah. <laughs> they've, they've stopped it from leaning more, thank goodness. But yeah. back then they didn't have very good soils engineers, I guess, and it just started leaning. But they've shored it up now. We can check that. But the place where we like to linger is a half an hour away, and it is called Luca. And Luca is just a wonderful slice of Italian life, and it's contained in an old, I think it's an 18th century fortification. And this was state of the art um, back then when they had cannons and they had to have not tall walls, but squat, thick walls that couldn't be pulverized by cannonballs. And today, of course, there's no need for that wall anymore, and it provides a little park. And you can rent a bike and you can bike around the park. Uh, and that's an easy thing for people to do on their free time, isn't it, David, if they are so yeah. inclined? Yeah, Luca is one of one of my favorite towns in Europe. Uh, the the city walls are are immaculate and they're just in perfect shape, and they are turned into this beautiful promenade uh, with lots of different varieties of trees, lots of shade, lots of greenery, and you can bike and hike and jog and walk with your dog, with your children, with your grandparents. It's just it's just a a perfect place. Um, it's a it's a, it's a passeggiata on two wheels. Bravo, correct. Yeah, passeggiata on two wheels. People are in great moods. Here's a square that is the shape of an amphitheater. It was built around the ancient Roman amphitheater, and then they took the amphitheater away, and they have a circular piazza right now. It's just a delightful place. Luca, L-U-C-C-A, just a, maybe an hour and a half or so away from Florence, uh, and uh, half an hour from Pisa, and about an hour from the Cinque Terre. I love the lakes, David, in northern Italy. Uh, and of all the lakes, my favorite is Lake Como. Um, I think Lake Como is nicknamed in Italy honeymoon country or something like that. Uh, yes. It's sort of a romantic destination. This is where George Clooney has his place, of course. Here's you can take uh, you can take a steamer to tour the lake. And uh, I just love the old steamers. And on our tours that go to Lake Como, we have time to get a lake pass if we like and check out all the sites. Here we got the famous town of Bellagio. And just across the way is my favorite, Varena. And in the distance, you see the mountains of Switzerland. You are just right there where Italy is sort of welded to the Alps and uh, Varena, here's the ferry coming into the town of Varena. And this is just such a charming place. And I know on, on uh, our, I, I believe it's our Best of Italy tour. This is where we meet our group, isn't it? It's just an yes. hour north of Milan. It's a good place to start a tour. Perfect, yeah. When you go to, a, when you, when you go to Lago di Como, it's a good chance to sort of just get used to Italy. Uh, up in the north, where the things are a little less hot, a little less crowded, a little more orderly, and a beautiful, beautiful part of northern Italy is the Dolomite, the Dolomites. And this is part of the Alps that arc across Europe from the, the from Marseille, where, where the mountains plunge into the sea in the south of France, all the way through Switzerland, through Austria, to Italy and Slovenia. And there's something unique about about Italy's Dolomites, they look different, don't they, David? They do. They have a unique geology. The kind of stone that 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 that, that forms the Dolomites, the Dolomiti, is a unique uh, formation, and it's so dramatic. It creates this incredible chiaroscuro, like in art, you know, chiaroscuro, dark and dark and light effect, like this ah. very deep three D effect. And this is ah. in this picture is the Tre Cime di Lavaredo, the three peaks of Lavaredo one of the most dramatic of the Dolomites. Wow. And it's also the three languages of this region. What we see, I, I, I'm sure I got out of the car just to, because I'm always trying to teach as a tour guide, trying to illustrate cultural things and demographic issues and so on. And here we have um, Sud Tyrol and Alto Adige. That's the German and the Italian name for the regions. One is the South Tyrol, and the other is the High Adige, the, the Adige River Valley. Uh, so one's from an Italian orientation, one's from a German orientation or Austrian. But we got we got three words on the top. Tell us what those words are. 
Yeah, the first one is the German uh, welcome, in, uh, welcome in German, uh, because in the area Germany, German is one of the, the most important languages spoken. Benvenuti is welcome in Italian, and the one in the middle, and the one on the right is, uh, which I'm pretty sure it's pronounced uh, uh, big news, benvenuto in Ladino, which is the ancient local language, the pre-Roman language that was spoken they're still spoken in the area with a new evolution, of course. Yeah, so there's actually a small linguistic group there that speaks, what is it called, Romanche? Romanche or Ladino, yeah. Oh, Ladino, Romanche or Ladino. Right. The, the, the Swiss group is Romanche, Ladino. Now, I really liked the LPD Susie, and over the years, you know, we've done our, we've experimented, tried here, there, we've been partnering with experts like you who live there, and we find the, the, the most characteristic opportunity in each region to really understand that region and the Dolomites are a big park and I just love the Alpi di Susi. This is the highest meadow, the high alpine meadow, the biggest high alpine meadow in Europe. And it's just a, a it's just a wonderland. It's like, it's, it, it's got these idyllic farms and wonderful easygoing trails and this menacing Schlern mountain looking south into the rest of the Italian peninsula. That is the Alpi di Susi. And David, that for me is better than going to the beach. Look at that. Yeah, it's it's an incredible experience and feeling. I know what you mean. It's just life is good when you're up in the Dolomites and it's not too hot, but it's sunny and you've had a good walk and you know you're going to have a great, great dinner waiting for you down in Castle Roto. We have two names for this place, Castle Roto and Castle Ruth, because... One is the German, one is the Italian, yeah. So it's a, it's an interesting mix, but uh, I mean... It just my I just caught on that that is like a postcard and I just love Castle Ruth. Hey, we're gonna now just we're gonna go to several towns. You know, we did Venice, Florence, Rome last week on a special episode of this same festival. Now we're looking at the the smaller towns. Verona is famous for its Roman sites. There's a lot of Roman um, architecture in the city, and it's a big hit for Romeo and Juliet. Of course, there's the the fanciful balcony. There's the Roman arena. Uh, and then uh, nearby is Volterra. What's unique about Volterra in your mind, David? Volterra, Volterra is uh, the furthest northern Etruscan town. The Etruscans were the people that used to live in central Italy on the western side before the Roman conquest. So very ancient population. And Volterra, its architecture and the, panora- and the setting and the panoramic views from Volterra are just breathtaking. And it's a very quintessential, authentic hill town of Tuscany. I think it is quintess- I think it is a quintessential hill town, and a lot of people know it from the uh, popular uh, novel or and movie um, Twilight. I was just there last month, as you know, David, with our guide training tour, and we met the mayor, and he made it very clear there is no indication of any interest or activity with vampires in Volterra in any of the town's records. There's never been vampires there. It's just such a romantic and atmospheric and moody hill town cloaked in clouds that it seems like a good base for a Volterra kind of, or for a Twilight kind of story. This is Annie, and Annie is one of our local guides. Uh, David, can you explain how, when we do a tour, you could give a tour at every stop along the way, but many times we hire a local guide, don't we? We do, we do. We strongly, we firmly believe that... um, the job as a tour guide together with the job of a local guide who's the expert of the of the area you're visiting in that very moment on the tour provides the best um, level of information and quality of tour possible. A local and, guide within two hours, two and a half hours, one and a half hour delivers the best uh, learning you know, experience possible about their hometown. And you huddle um, at, a, at a round table with the other uh, guides, Rick Steves guides to Italy and debate which are the good guides and who do we want to hire again and what is worth the time and what is worth the, uh, the, 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 the investment to have these local guides. Consequently, it's not just the next guy on the, guide on the list. These are friends, these are experts, these are passionate teachers that really like our groups and understand our program. And they're part of our family, aren't they? We have individual guides that don't lead the tours. They are the local guides that really are a critical part of the mix. Definitely. I've been at Annie, Annie's house and her husband, Francesco, who's a colleague of mine at Rick Steves, many times. We're, we're great friends and mm-hmm. colleagues, of course. 
And he's a great uh, sommelier and a great wine teacher. Because the first time I met Francisco, he was giving one of our groups a wine tasting. And I, I was doing my book research, David, and I couldn't, I'm supposed to just check it and get on to the next thing because I'm just going bam, bam, bam all day. I yeah. had to stay there and listen and sip yeah. that wine and be inspired by him. And those are the kind of people that we love to get on board. And, um, and, and please, let's, let's regroup again in Edmonds because he's my roommate. He's a great roommate because he knows everything about wine. Trust me. Oh, so. he's, <laughs> he's, he's, a, he's a good guy. Hey, uh, speaking yeah. of that, uh, I just want to remember, we're gonna, you're a great musician. Uh, and that's, I love when, when guides uh, play to their strengths, you know. And uh, you actually brought your band, it's called Bartender, uh, to Edmonds when you came uh, uh, before COVID hit. And I want to remind people, if they want to hear your band, they can just Google uh, Bartender and uh, Orvieto. I think that would let them find it. Um, sure. Yeah. Or, or the and, website, uh, bartendersound.com. It's, it's very easy to find. Bartender Sound. And we'll also have that link on the information about this show. But you and I are going to enjoy some music by, uh, well, by you on the guitar and singing when we get back together again on January 29th. We have a show called The Joy of Italy, and we're going to be talking about Italian culture. So if you'd like more on Italy, and if you would like to hear David sing and play his guitar, illustrating the beautiful musical traditions in different parts of Italy, put that in your calendar. Join us again on January 29th on, on this same station, same time. Uh, for the joy of Italy. You mentioned oh, Volterra was the farthest north Etruscan town, and it has an Etruscan gate. That's the old Etruscan gate from 500 years before Christ. This is before the Roman Empire. And what we know about the Etruscans mostly is from their sarcophagi, how they decorated their tombs. A uh, beautiful thing in Volterra, apart from the um, uh, Etruscan history and so on and heritage, is the alabaster workshops. And uh, I was just there with our group as we were uh, demonstrating the importance of it, making all the experiences happen. We dropped into the alabaster workshop. We got the demonstration. We got to hold the alabaster still hot after being molded on that lathe. And then we realized all of that stuff that they made right there is in the shop next door if you want to get a souvenir. Hey, then we go, we can uh, consider Padova or Padua. And uh, it's just like half an hour from Venice. You know, it's interesting to me, David, a lot of people don't even know about Padua because it's in the shadow of Venice and everybody is crazy about Venice, understandably so. But we like to stop at Padua in our uh, village Italy, in our small town Italy uh, itinerary. It's famous among pilgrims because of the Basilica of St. Anthony. He's beloved for um, devout Catholics and this is a beautiful church to check out. I just love the arcades of Padua. And I love the Scrovini Chapel, which is the best example of work by Giotto. And David, it's a university town, isn't it? Yes, it is. The and second what, oldest in the world. What's going on here? This looks like quite an interesting gathering of students. Yeah, this is probably some kind of funny protest, some gathering of students. There's always something going on in places like Padua, Bologna, the old university cities. And this is, uh, it, according to their faces, it looks like a, like a funny, a funny cultural event or somehow like a funny protest. I think they're 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 roasting a graduate when somebody yes. gets yeah in this case yeah this is the graduate you're right yeah I can I can see that from the from the <laughs> <laughs> from her from her from her interesting shirt. Um yeah but this is uh when you come to uh, a university town in um uh, in Padova they don't have a graduation time it's all year long when they do their paper and stuff they're they're finished and then uh, now they're a doctor and their friends roast them and they make all sorts of uh, funny jokes about them and the whole idea is to make sure they don't get too big of a head because they've got letters before their name now uh yeah. Ra ravenna is a beloved stop for people who like art history because in ravenna you've got these churches that go back to the end of the Roman Empire. This is really the cusp between ancient art and medieval art. In this same church, you can see Jesus without a beard, portrayed as he was in ancient Roman times, and Jesus with a beard, portrayed as he was in medieval times, sort of the, the, the transitionary time. But look at those mosaics and consider that that is from the end of the Roman Empire, 1500 years ago. Yes. These are the places that pictures don't do justice. Yeah. This is a beautiful picture, but these places must be seen in person. There's no just, other way. I was just thinking that, David, because I'm looking at that and I'm blown away because I stood right there. And this is beautiful to see, but boy, in person, it's just mind blowing. And to have a guide to explain it. 
the whole the whole thing the whole building in this case this is um san vitale is made by of mosaics a third of an inch by a third of an inch tiles so that's, that's, that's even like, difficult to speak about maybe four of them would fit on my little fingernail ha <laughs> correct correct and this is the uh, emperor justinian and his game yeah. wow well and there's more and more in italy italy just keeps on going assisi we know assisi because of saint francis there is his basilica I love the approach to Assisi, the great church that honors St. Francis, the hill, the ruined castles you can hike up to. Um, I took this shot. This is one of the oldest photographs I own. This was from 1979 when I was in college and I was here picnicking on top of the, uh, the ruined castle in Assisi. And I remember sitting there thinking, I'm hearing the same bird song that inspired St. Francis. I mean, imagine that. And if you can just understand, let the, the magic of the moment take you back. And then, of course, when you're in Assisi, you'll check out uh, the Basilica of St. Francis, uh, the beloved Italian saint. Um, and uh, you can step in there and we would have a beautiful opportunity to enjoy the most exquisite art of the high Middle Ages. Then we're coming down to your territory, closer and closer to your home in Orvieto. And here we're looking at Siena. What, when you look at this uh, photograph here, David, what do you see that is unique about Siena? Siena is one of the most incredible uh, towns in Italy and Europe. This is Piazza del Campo. This is the the the, le the least <laughs> regular shaped square I think I've ever seen. <laughs> There's no one thing that's either flat or straight. <laughs> and it used to be a field, it used to be a farm field in the heart of Siena, of oh, medieval Campo. Siena. Campo, yeah. Campo means yeah. Campo means field. Farm field with right. the tower of the manja the tallest tower one of the tallest towers in italy so you can climb if you're a climber you can climb the tower if you're a hiker you can hike around <laughs> siena and it's a city that's still frozen in time yeah. um in from the 1300s from the time of the black plague because the black plague hit siena dramatically mm -hmm. and unfortunately also because of that thanks to that we can still admire siena almost exactly looking like it used to look like 700 years ago it's it's an incredible place you know that's interesting so many of the most popular and beautiful and appreciated places today were very rich and, and important and powerful in their day but then something happened and economic went very bad and they became mothballed and just not even too poor to even tear down and build up new and then in modern times they get discovered and everybody goes wow i mean bruges in belgium is that way and um, as you just explained to me right now, Siena was a big power until the Black Plague hit, and then it sort of uh, derailed its importance. But it is a proud city. And here, when you see on the main square, no church spire, but the city hall spire, you can see this sort of humanism of, of uh, early, of Renaissance Italy and the importance Italians put on, on good civics. Uh, and uh, I just love the, the emphasis on that in our travels. You mentioned you can climb to the top of that tower. Here's the view looking down at Il Campo from the tower. And that Il Campo Square is where I love to pay a little bit more than necessary to get a nice drink. I could get a spritz there. Um, and uh, in fact, that looks like it might be some kind of a spritz. And um, if I can read the, um, the, uh, the receipt there, it's 11 euros for two cocktails and in Italy, when you buy a couple of cocktails at magic hour, you know, before dinner, you usually get some uh, little extra uh, snacks with it, don't you? Oh, yeah. It's called aperitivo. Ital Italians never really drink only or eat only. We eat and drink at the same time. Right. So here, I mean, that's $12 for two cocktails and uh, two little sandwiches and some chips on the most expensive piece of real estate in Siena. What a great place just to sit and watch the world go by. I think that must be sort of a, an art form or a sport or a, a beloved tradition among Italians is just to sit down and, and watch everybody stroll by. Mm -hmm. And comment their look. <laughs> and, and comment on their looks. That's yeah. funny. Yeah, I, I, I love to hang out with my Italian friends and just kind of get up to date on the fashions and everything. And this square is like going to the beach. I just love Il Campo. And thank you for reminding me, it means field. That's what I love hanging out with my guide friends. Like Campo di Fiori is field of the flowers in Rome. Yeah. That's where they used to here. sell fruit and vegetables still today. That's right. And and people just in, in Siena, they're saying, I'll see you at the field. 
I'll see you down right. at the field, Il Campo. But this is one moment, and then this is another moment at the same place. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that, Il Campo, Il Campo. And what's going on here, David? Huh. Well, this is the, the most incredible uh, festival of Siena and in, in one of the finest in Italy is the uh, the horse race um, of uh, the Palio, Palio di Siena. Oh. Uh, twice a year uh, in July and August, they uh, have a race um, and they, they run three laps around the loop of the square. So they put down, as you can see, they put down the tracks and the people are inside the tracks. So the people are trapped inside the tracks for hours in July and August in Italy, yeah. so warm, very warm. And you are trapped with them here in this picture. <laughs> and then they and they enjoy the, the show. It's not just a race, it's an it's a, like their national proud pride. Oh. You know, and it's a it's a it's not for tourists. They don't care about tourists here. This is really for the locals, and each neighborhood is competing. I'm wearing a scarf of a certain neighborhood, and uh it it is just pandemonium. I just absolutely love it. And um you know, when we do our tours, David, if there's a festival going on, we're aware of it. And if it makes sense, we can we can kind of nip into it and check it out. Or if it makes sense to avoid it, we can do that. But I love the fact that when a Rick Steves tour bus is going through the town, our guides know what's happening and we know how to make it um, as smooth and enjoyable and memorable as possible. Now we're at your hometown, the beautiful town of Orvieto. As you look at this, what 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 goes your through your mind right now? Uh, this is where I am now. I'm just, uh, you see the hills just around behind the town. That's where I live. I live 10 minute drive from the center. My parents live just to the left of the cathedral. They're what? sleeping now, I hope. <laughs> and um, yeah, it, it's it's where I was uh, was born, raised. And uh, this is my this is my DNA. This is my whole life. And, and this is a classic hill town. It's on a volcanic sort of a plug. And you can see those cliffs there. I love the walk, David. You can, there's a beautiful walk. You go down some stairs and you can walk the perimeter of the town at the base of the cliff. That's that's a pleasant sort of way to get a little exercise. Yeah, it's gorgeous. 5K, it's, it's called the loop around town, the ring. We call it the ring around the rock. There you go. And the rock is honeycombed with all sorts of um, wells and, and cantinas and yeah. fortifications. And, and, and you took us into the cathedral. This was you one month ago as I came to town with uh, 20 guides who were training to be Rick Steves guides. And uh, we wanted them to see how you give a tour in the beautiful cathedral here. There's so much art in situ. Uh, it's great to see art, uh, not in hanging on the walls in the museum. I mean, that's nice too, but to actually see it where it was de designed to be, isn't it? Yes, definitely. The Duomo of Orvieto is uh, one of those places. You want to see it um, and, and you want to see each piece that was designed for this specific reason. It's it's incredible, but at the same time, not as easy as, you, as one would think to guide in a town that's over 3,000 years old. And 3,000 yeah. years of, of civilization, oh. it's piled up like a layer cake of history, like a lasagna, we would say, of history. Underground is the ancient times, and then above, you have the Duomo and the medieval town. In fact, I'm so, that, that to me is such a wonderful challenge for a tour guide, and one of my favorite things to do is, is to, it's just a quick stop, we don't spend the night in Orvieto, but to stop at the train station, ride the funicular and the bus up into the town center, walk the group through the town with maps so everybody sees all the options and they know they get their bearings. You get to the far side of the town with a nice view looking off into the countryside and then turn them loose. We'll meet you back at the cathedral in a couple of hours, grab a bite to eat, poke around, explore as you like, and then we go on to the next place. Here's another example of a hill town. This is one of my favorite little discoveries, one of my back doors. It's called Civita di Bagnoreggio and you can see how that is just a perfect natural fortification in the Middle Ages. When Rome fell, that was a political vacuum and people just literally ran for the hills and people would build their houses up there. It can be kind of a headache these days, but in the old days, it was comforting to be on a hill like this. As a matter of fact, the Pope used your town for his refuge in bad times, didn't he? Many times, many Popes did, yes. Orvieto was a safe haven. Uh, mm -hmm. On a hilltop with water, we access to water through, through lots of wells. It was just a perfect spot for defensive reasons. 
So nice. Now, David, you've done, uh, you've guided our Tuscany tour, and we've long wanted to do a tour just of Tuscany. Now we have an itinerary of Tuscany. I'm going to just kind of go through the slides here, and if you can explain to us a little bit about the Tuscany tour and what we're looking at here. Characteristic sort of lanes with the cypress trees. Yeah. This, mm. is, this is quintessential Tuscany. When you think of Tuscany, you think of cypress trees, this kind of greenery. Tuscany is overwhelmed with, with beautiful cypress trees, decorated cypress trees in driveways. The word comes from Etruscan, doesn't it? Etruscan, yeah. Tuscany. Tuscany. Tuscany almost looks exactly like the ancient Etruscan. It's called Empire here. It was a, an organization of 12 city-states. Like United States are 50 states. The Etruscans were divided into 12 city-states. One was Orvieto, one was Volterra, and many others. And then... Um, Today, Tuscany looks almost like the shape of Tuscany. Uh, Tuscana, Tushana, Etruscan, Etruscan. That's why the genesis of the word of Tuscany comes from Etruscan. Now I see Siena right pretty much in the middle where we were just talking. Uh, yes. I can see Volterra, the town that we all know and love, which was yes. uh, Etruscan center. Way in the north, you see Pisa just barely making it in Florence. And it goes uh, uh, Cortona, that's the, the town from under the Tuscan sun. And then uh, all the far south of Tuscany goes almost to Rome, but not quite to Rome. You can see the Tiber. So the Roman Empire, Rome grew up on the border between the Greek colony of Magda Graecia in southern Italy and the Etruscan Empire in northern Italy. And Rome was right in the middle there. As far as you could go up the river and the first place you could cross on a bridge, pretty cool place for a great city to be born. And the Etruscan yeah. Empire is worth checking out. I'm sorry, David, were you going to say something? No, no, definitely. Rome, the, the Roman culture before becoming the Rome that we all know, the Roman Empire, was the Latins. They were called the Latins, and they were one of the many uh, pre-Roman civilizations, I usually say. Then the, the Roman expansion started taking over all of the neighbor, uh, former friend uh, yeah. neighbors. Uh, the Etruscans in the north and other populations, the Gauls in France, and then the Greek and then the Northern African cultures. So the Roman expansion started from the area of Rome and then took over the whole Mediterranean world. And it, got, it, it, it got so big that the, the word Rome no longer referred to the city, but the entire civilized world as far as Correct. they were concerned. Here we have a local guide, Roberto Becchi, a wonderful a friend of ours who, who meets our groups, uh, talking about the Etruscan heritage. And we wind around and we remember in Florence is part of Tuscany, so our Tuscany tour does include a stop in Florence with the uh, Ponte Vecchio and the Arno River and the characteristic area across from the river and of course the Medici's uh, Palace and a, a chance to see Michelangelo's David. But we're all about small towns and, and uh, the countryside. Chianti country, right? What, is, uh, what does Chianti country mean, mean to, a, to, a, to, a, to a Tuscan? Chianti is a stretch, is a section of Tuscany that's divided between, that's uh, placed between Florence in the north and Siena in the south. The, the area between the two major cities of Tuscany is called Chianti. Okay. And Chianti Classico is the area where they produce the Chianti Classico wines, the heart of Chianti. And uh, Chianina beef comes from Chianti. Chianina beef comes from nearby Chianti, yes, yep. from uh, further east uh, from okay. Chianti, but so like there's, this, Chianti. there's this salt of the earth kind of culture where you got your local beef, your local wine, your love of the land. Valdorca has a sort of romantic appeal to travelers also. Yes, Valdorca is, part, is a big part of our Tuscany tour, Rick Steves Europe. It's the most iconic area of Tuscany. It's where they filmed lots of scenes from the movie, the famous movie, The Gladiator, mm. uh, from Ridley Scott, you know? And mm. um, and, and the, the landscape of Valdorca is just, it, it looks like almost like being on the moon sometimes. And we can visit a farm. Certo. This is Luciano <laughs> from a farm we visit during uh, our tour. And he's feeding his uh, his pigs prosciutto. Yeah, we visit future prosciutto eh, sì. future prosciutto future capocollo future lombetto future, you do delicious, you do this, future, do this. future many things <laughs> <laughs> that's it's luciano in, in his magic room i love to meet the people the salt of the earth farmers they're so proud of their work and to taste it right there you know they're, they're, it's just such a joy it's a celebration amazing luciano is a wealth of knowledge when it comes to everything tuscany from the times of world war ii he was a little kid during the war so he has incredible stories to tell all the time but then everything that became uh today 
big, big part of Tuscany. This is a caprese salad mm. with the colors of the Italian flag, mozzarella, white, tomato, red, basil, green. Mm. Then you have capocollo and prosciutto on the right, the cold mm. cuts. Then you have fresh ricotta drizzled with olive oil and mm. and um, and uh, some uh, some herbs. And then more on the left, I mean. Tuscany. You know, I just, I just went to a restaurant, which is a pretty good restaurant here in Seattle, and I, I ordered my caprese salad. And I just was so disappointed. I, I, it's almost a curse to have eaten in Italy because things will never be as good <laughs> after that. I mean, the tomatoes uh, in Italy, the tomatoes taste like, like you've never tasted a tomato in the United States. I don't know what it is. And the, and the mozzarella and, and the bufala and the olive oil and prosciutto. And, and then you match it with the right wine. David, it's not yes. fair. It's not fair. You've got such beautiful food culture it's uh yeah it's also you know food is not just food yeah you, you are you said exactly right it's a big part of our culture if you find if you meet an italian that that has eaten a poor meal that would be a bad time to meet an italian ah and i just the way the italian the italians love to talk about the meal as they eat it they they are all chefs it seems like and they'll say oh they they harvested this too too early this year or the the sun was out or whatever and it's this whole slow food this uh zero kilometer meals and so on uh, and visiting pienza is a, a great opportunity to find a classic tuscan town with all sorts of artisan shops and and it's it's just it's a a, a delightful stop in Pienza, isn't it? Yeah, the town of Pius II and the capital of Pecorino from Tuscany. Pecorino is from Tuscany. See, there's history, but there's also food always together. So Pius II, Pecorino cheese of Pienza. That is so great. It's so true. There's food and culture together with the wine, with the wine tasting. Look at that. Oh my goodness. And I wanted to get to this because this is our new book. I'm so excited about this. I've got a good friend named Fred Plotkin. And Fred is as passionate about Italian culture as I am. He's my age. He's been teaching his heart out about Italy for decades. He's in New York. And uh, he wrote a book called The Gourmet Guide to Italian Food. And uh, it's, it's a classic book. But it, I needed to sprightly it up and make it practical and more up to date for travelers. So Fred and I with my good friend and partner, Cameron Hewitt, who spearheaded the project in our office, we got together and we turned Fred's uh, retired book into this brand new book. We spliced our fun and passion for Italian food into this. And this is just coming out this month. It's in the bookstores right now. We've got it on our website. But when I said food culture, you know, I go to Italian history through the art and, 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 and Fred goes to Italian culture through the food, you know, through the hearth, from the table. And it comes across in his love of cuisine. And I'm just so proud and thankful to have this book available. If anybody is a eater and they wanna have what you need to know to appreciate Italian food, everything you need to know to eat your way through Italy is in this brand new book. Include a wonderful map on the back that uh, our good buddy Dave Herline and my staff made. And this is brand new. You can find it wherever you get your books and we have it on our website also. Um, another dimension is to find these artisans, isn't it? Do you, have you met Cesare in Multipulciano? I met him a few years ago, yes, yes. What a wonderful silversmith and to visit, and a coppersmith, and to visit his work. And he's so proud of what he makes. And you can see the work, and then you can go home with a souvenir that you'll always remember. A great souvenir is an appreciation of Italian wine. This is like going to a cathedral, isn't it? It is. Uh, as you as you said uh, correctly, there is no much difference between producing wine, producing um, um, silver crafts, uh, making leather. Italians, we love our crafts, whether they're edible or not. So to us, there's no difference between them. Um, this Look is a this there. is a Brunello winery. I mean, yeah, it doesn't get any better than that. You get Look. in here. You like if you like wine, you can stay there for, for weeks <laughs> in, in the underground cellar. Look how big those, look at the people down there, David. Those are huge casks and they're filled with gorgeous wine. And then we get to try it and to develop a taste for it. And it is such, such a beautiful part, such a beautiful dimension of traveling, especially in Italy. Um, tell us what you do as far as with the groups on a, a cooking experience. Yes, yeah, so when in Val d'Orcia, in the heart of Tuscany, uh, we stay at one of the beautiful properties. And in this picture, we have Isabella and her chef, 
Um, and Isabella is teaching us how to make peachy pasta, the typical pasta of Valdorcia, like this long, fresh, thick spaghetti. Mm -hmm. uh, as you can see, uh, these friends are, are, are hard, uh, you know, producing, like they're, they're committed to production because then we eat what we produce. And if they don't like do this, it right, right, we get very upset. Yes. Yeah, so I got to supervise the whole thing. And I always put the apron on and, 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 and join in and chip in and make sure that the peachy are, are fine. <laughs> Otherwise, it will be a difficult dinner, you know. I made some horrible peachy pasta myself, but to have made it for the rest of my life, I know what it is, you know, and I appreciate yeah. it better. And I remember Isabella and her beautiful place. And, and it's very easy. You do it once, you do it twice, third time, you can serve it to all of your friends. And it's a beautiful moment with the kids and, and the grandparents really is a great moment. Now, now, 20, 30 years ago, when I, I don't, I've never told you this before, David, but I think 30 years ago, when I first, when I, when I researched and I wrote the first edition of this book, I loved Petigliano, and but I had to limit my book coverage, and uh, I decided not to include that in the book. And that was when I was a kid, almost, you know. Um, and we've had other towns that we we go to all the towns that I've showed you so far in this slideshow. But uh, I'm so glad that with our local guides, with you and our other friends who are Italians, we include Petigliano in our tour program. This is a this great is example of a of an underrated town that is a, a delight from yeah. a traveler's point of view. This is this is really one of the many reasons why I love to guide the Tuscany tour. And I'm so thankful that you are offering this tour because this is real Tuscany. Tuscany is much more than we all think of. You know, the big the big guys of Tuscany, the big highlights. Yep. Pitigliano is backbone Tuscany. And we we go there and we spend the day there. And it's just it's just marvelous. I mean, every time I'm there. Uh, yeah, the whole tour is designed uh, to give a real taste of Tuscany. I got to mention, I have been to um, places that are just inundated with tour groups. Um, I don't normally say bad things about a particular place, but there's a place called Greve. You know Greve? Greve in Chianti, yes. And it's just, it's just a, a, a massive supermarket of tour buses. And everybody goes there and it's their token little bit of Tuscany. And then they go back to Florence and then over the Leaning Tower of Pisa. It's yeah. a challenge as uh, tour organizers and tour guides to try to find the real thing with so much tourism and so much commercialism. And you guys do a marvelous job at that, I think. Grazie. Well, the reason why everybody goes to places like Greve, uh, there are many more all over Italy because it's a big destination, is because the logistics are easy. Yeah. So the tour groups are logistically e easy, like, ah, there's no, not thinking about it. Let's just get there, drop the group and go back. Yeah. And then while here, for example, we struggle a little bit to park the bus when we get to Pitigliano, we got to know where to take the curve, what, which yeah. curve not to take. So the tour members love that. And we love to finally show them real Pitigliano, you know? You know this, this is kind of related, but in a different country. I was just in Switzerland in the Berner Oberland and getting from the tourist resort of Grindelwald up to the Jungfrau Jok, they've just spent a hundred million dollars making a, tra uh, a cable car to skip the train line to Kleine Scheidig and save 45 minutes of time. So everybody has more time in the village to do their shopping, you know, but they yeah, don't yeah. want to spend any time getting somewhere. If they can just get from A to B, they see it, they check it off and they go back to their hotel and go shopping. That's front door tourism. That's mass yeah, yeah. tourism. What we like is experiential tourism. And we find that with good local leadership like yours. In fact, explain to us this whole slice of Italian culture here. <laughs> Yeah, this is, again, this is another incredible moment on our Tuscany tour. We go to the region of Maremma, which is the southwestern uh, area of Tuscany along the coast. And uh, we visit a butteri farm. Butteri are the so-called, allow me to say, uh, uh, Tuscan cowboys. Don't call them cowboys because they get really upset about it because there's an old story of challenge gone wrong. But they manage wild cows. These cows... The Mariman cows that you see in the picture, they live in the wilderness. And wow. every morning, the butteri cowboys, they go get them, gather them in a herd, and then um, man manage them and, 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 and check them out. And if they're sick, they fix them, they check them out. And, and then they release them in the wilderness. So they live wild. It's an incredible experience. It's a cultural experience. 
So we meet these people and we learn that interesting slice. And then we go out to Elba. And Elba is just a wonderful opportunity to go to an island, famous, we all know it from our history books because Columb uh, Columbus, Napoleon was uh, exiled there. Uh, but Elba is a great chance for just a little vacation from our vacation, some time on the beach. Uh, and people love it, don't they? Yeah, we catch the ferry from mainland Tuscany into Elba. It's an hour and 15 minute uh, ferry ride. The ride is beautiful on these big ferries. The bus goes on the ferry. We spend a couple of nights on Elba. We have access to visiting the towns of Porto Ferraio, Porto Zuro. People can rent a scooter if they feel like it. They can bike, they can hike, they can just sunbathe and go to the beach. And uh, Who's this I love guy? Elba. Who's this guy? This guy is Napoleone, who carries an Italian name, but he, he was the emperor of France because he what? was originally from Corsica. I've never heard Napoleon's name pronounced in Italian. Do it again. Napoleone. Napoleone, Napoleone. Bonaparte. Yes. Napoleone. Bonaparte. Bonaparte was his last Certo. name. Yeah. Porque no. He was from yeah. Corsica. Oh, Nowadays, man. Corsica is French. Now you can hop on a, a strange little cable car there and get up to the top for a grand yeah. view on the island. The highest peak in uh, in the heart of the island, you see the island from 360 degrees. Elba. And, and beautiful little port towns. Porto Ferraio, yeah, this is the Medici Harbor because the Medici control most of Tuscany. So everywhere they they took over, they put their name and their logo on oh, with yeah. the five or six balls. And this is the Medici Harbor, the Darsena Medicia. Nice. All right. Now, we're, I'm going to go just a little farther south for a moment, uh, an hour or to south of uh, Rome, we get to uh, Napoli, Naples, and of course, uh, skyline is Mount Vesuvius, and that's the volcano that erupted 79 years after Christ and buried Pompeii. Fascinating opportunity to go to a Roman city that was excavated after the volcano. And just south of that, Sorrento is the gateway to the Amalfi Coast. And Sorrento is limoncello country, I'll tell you. As much as Naples is an urban jungle and an intense place, Sorrento is just a sweet, strolling, relaxing, a very, very cozy feeling place, uh, really into its lemons, that's for sure, and its passeggiata and its gelato. And from uh, Sorrento, you can side trip very easily down the Amalfi Coast. This is Positano. And Positano is just a delight for people that like to shop and lay on the beach and make the scene. And it's kind of fun just to see the kind of the movie star angle of Italian coastline there, as opposed to the Cinque Terre, isn't it? Yeah, the Amalfi Coast is another incredible uh, area of, of my country. And the whole peninsula, the Amalfi Coast and the Sorrento Peninsula mm. are magic. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it can be upscale, it can be easygoing, but it's just phenomenal you can see the pictures the pictures speak by themselves then you get to capri and you go a little boat right out to capri and that is a dramatic island uh, even more dramatic than elba in some ways uh, i just want to finish off here um david talking about the amazing food culture a little bit more i just love going into a uh, the, the place where all the local workers go for their lunch and just uh, the guy who's got the best cheese and and uh, salami and bread in town uh, you can really find some great opportunities just to have somebody make you a sandwich right on the spot, can't you? Oh, yeah. The other day I was doing some, actually, some research for for the Tuscany tour, and I couldn't find a restaurant because, you know, it's January. Some places are closed yeah. and re yeah. renewing. Anyway, I went to this corner, like, a uh, food shop that was, like, kind of, it was kind of shady, and I was got I got into this little town, and the old lady was like, uh, we're closing. I'm like, do you, can you make me a sandwich? Fine. So ah. she made me one of the best sandwiches I've had I in my it. whole life. I've had the same experience, wow. and I haven't even understood what she's saying, but I know it was just like, fine. And then she makes me an amazing sandwich. I love, I did that in Orvieto when I just had a little bit of time. I stopped by a, a shop like this, a deli, and for yeah. me, it is a great lunch. Wonderful, wonderful fresh produce, a wonderful opportunity to have the best gelato you can imagine. Uh, when yeah. we're traveling in Italy, you know, that's just part of the... When I crossed the border into Italy, I remember there was a tradition we'd say, il dolce far niente. Yeah. What is that? We still do that. The sweet doing nothing. The sweetness <laughs> of doing nothing. Grab a gelato and lick the drips as they trickle down the cone. One thing that I know you enjoy sharing with our groups is a chance to follow a farmer with his dog. And what are we hunting for? There you are with one of our groups. We're hunting for magic. We're hunting for truffle. 
this underground underground thing that grows nobody sees it when it grows but when the dogs find it their their tails wiggle and the truffle hunter uh dig it out and it becomes heaven you shave it raw on the food and uh oh my it, goodness you, you must try it you must try it fresh so these are a truffle is like an underground mushroom that grows yeah, on, it's, on a root it's a fungus it's a it's a fungus uh mm, growing underground it has to grow in lack of oxygen cannot grow in open air so it creates this the spores get fed by by water and minerals and they start expanding and they create this underground chamber and when the chamber cracks the ceiling cracks the gas leaks to the seal to the top and that's when the dogs smell it and that's when the dogs dig oh. it out and that's what you find so the dog knows which ones are ready to be found actually correct the dogs are uh, the truffle dogs are so expensive because they are fully trained and they do not dig rotting truffles or right. uh, non-ripe unripe and they truffles. don't and they, they don't eat it because that would be a bad dog bad dog correct they don't eat it so <laughs> training a truffle dog it's a hard job and that's why those dogs are so expensive also because truffle can be very expensive uh does this mean expensive how do you how do you say expensive with your hand oh like that right how much would that Franke, cost right there also Just, oh boy yeah how much quanto costa quick the one you see in the picture is a black uh black truffle it's good quality black truffle that could be maybe a hundred 150 euro but when you find the white truffle which is the strongest in flavor the for the least quantity the stronger the flavor it can now cost uh easily three grand two grand four grand uh, for tufo. Tartufo. Wow. Tartufo. Two thousand. Wow. Tartufo. Yeah, that's the word. And uh, it can be really good. It can be really expensive. Hey, uh, David, I want to remind everybody that we have a lot of guides, uh, your colleagues that are wonderful. Your team in Italy does a great job. We have all of these different itineraries. We are out of time because I want to have questions with you. We've got people that are viewing from all over the United States and we want to have a few minutes for questions. Can you in but like 30 seconds, I would just like to hear you say the names of these places, review the itinerary of each of these, uh, just like read the map, where we start and where we finish, yeah. This is uh, my very first tour I did uh, 10 years ago at Rixtis, Village Italy. I love it because it stays for two nights in my hometown, Orvieto, you see, halfway. It's a V-shaped center, northern Italy, starts in Padua, northeast, uh, breeze from Venice, then we, uh, where we visit the university and the center of Padua for two nights. Then uh, we stop in Ravenna for the day. We go to the heart of Umbria, the region where I am from. We stay in Montefalco. When there, we do the truffle hunt and visit Assisi. Then we stop in the furthest southern point of this tour, which is my town, Orvieto, which, of course, it's my favorite place to guide because it's my home. And uh, we don't stay at my house, though. We stay at a hotel. And then we go further northwest into Tuscany. Uh, when in Orvieto, we also visit uh, a sub several other hill towns around. Then we go into Tuscany, we go into Chianti, we see phenomenal Siena, stay two nights in Chianti, two nights in Lucca, and then uh, we can bike the city walls, and then we get into the Italian Riviera, and then we finish in uh, northern Piedmont next to Switzerland. And it's a tour that I love because it touches seven regions out of our 20 regions of Italy. It's an amazing wow. itinerary. It's a great itinerary. I took it also because I wanted my family to see Italy uh, more more salt of the earth, you know, countryside Italy, rural Italy. And uh, you fly into Venice and there's a good connection to Padova. You fly home from Milano, there's an easy connection from Lake Orta. Now, the best of Tuscany, uh, whip us through that real quickly, please. Yes, the best of Tuscany, 12 days. We really explore uh, Tuscany in depth. We start in Florence tonight, but we see Florence in a slightly different way, not just the... The usual Florence, we go backbone Florence into the districts of Sant'Ambrogio, the, the market. We go see some incredible things. We see the Bargello Sculpture Museum, one of the most beautiful in Europe. Then we move into Chianti for two nights where we explore Chianti. We taste the local wines and the food. And then we go into Val d'Orcia for three nights where we have our cooking class. We learn how to make fresh pasta. We visit the Etruscan center of Tuscany, Pitigliano, the beautiful hill town not far from my hometown, Orvieto. And then we go uh, east, uh, west, sorry, on the coast of Maremma. We see the Butteri uh, show and experience a lunch at the Butteri farm with the big cows and the cowboys. And then we go on to Elba. We say hello to Napoleone. We don't meet Napoleone, but we can go to the beach, definitely. And then we go into Volterra and we end up in uh, beautiful Lucca. Volterra and Lucca, two of the most iconic Tuscan towns.
Napoleone. I'm still getting excited about that. That's so cool. Yes. And uh, oh man! And uh, here we got the best of Italy. And this is—I'll uh, just walk us through this one because uh, this one I know and love. It's the very best 17 days in Italy. Uh, you fly into Milan, but you take the train an hour north to get over jet lag on Lake Como in the romantic little town. This is honeymoon town, honeymoon country, Luna di Mille on the Lake of Como, and then over to the Dolomite, the, the Italian Alps. And this is all the greatest hits. Two nights, two days in Venice, a three-hour bus ride, and two days in Florence, an hour over to Pisa to see the famous Leaning Tower. You get your vacation from your vacation on the Italian Riviera, the Cinque Terre. You go to Siena. In my office, when somebody says Siena, somebody goes, Ooh, I love Siena. People just moan and say, I love Siena. There's something about <laughs> Siena. Then we swing by Assisi to uh, remember St. Francis, have a couple of days in Umbria and finish with a finale in the eternal city of Rome. I just love, just saying that gets my little travel endorphins doing flip-flops. Uh, this is just, man, we got a, we got a big tall glass of Italy here and, and with, with our tour guides. It's like a swizzle stick. It's just going to really, really be tasty. Here is the smaller version of the best of Italy. And this is a very good nine days. Uh, this is the tour that we did when you trained our guides because they had a good variety of everything. Uh, you start in Rome, you do the Eternal City, you go to the greatest hill town, mysterious, uh, um, you know, murky kind of uh, uh, stony Volterra. Then you go to the delightful Cinque Terre for your time on the beach and you finish with all the Renaissance wonders in Florence. Uh, here we have My Way Italy, and this is, a, 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 as I mentioned, this is the bones of the tour without the guide and the included admissions and everything. It's all the greatest hits there in 13 days, but you get the bus, you get the hotels, you get the breakfast, and you get the guidebook, you're on your own. And for a lot of people, that's uh, just the right cup of tea for them. I want to remind you on, on all of our tours, except for the My Way tours, which include almost nothing, uh, you get um, all group sightseeing at no extra cost. Uh, you get a small group of people, 25 or 28 people in that neighborhood on a 50 seat bus. So everybody gets like two seats on the bus. Uh, Full-time services of a great guide like David and also all the local guides. All the, group trans all the group transportation accommodations in memorable centrally located hotels. I would, memorable means characteristic. Characteristic means not modern. Characteristic and not modern means funky. It's not, you know, they're, they're creaky. They might not pass code in the United States, but if you're looking for memories, if you want to be handy and family run and, and, and just characteristic, these are my favorite hotels, all the breakfast, half your dinners and all of the tips for your guide and your driver. Plus you get a guidebook and a money belt. So that's a, a fun part of our tour program is making it a good value, making it efficient. I'd love to take you into our website. I'm not going to actually go to the website here, but I just want to remind you, if you're curious about anything that we do, whether you're traveling independently or on one of our tours, go to ricksteves.com. And right there, you got access to all the TV shows we've ever made, 500 hours of radio that we've made over the last 15 years, our web store, or things are uh, always available on our web store, uh, all of our guidebooks, all of our favorite accessories and so on, a travel forum, which is a booming community of travelers sharing information, uh, um, my uh, Classroom Europe program that, that lets you uh, uh, teach with our TV show, the latest on all our tours, and how to sign up for future travel festival events. Remember, tomorrow we're going to be drawing a name out of a virtual bucket and somebody who's joined us in this last week is going to win a free tour and we're going to do it again in a week and twice on the last day of this festival. Remember, if you sign up on any tour during the festival, you'll get a special little discount to make this festival a little more festive. Tomorrow, I'm going to be taking you back to the crazy days of our very beginnings before we had big buses back when I was the only guide when we had very rugged travelers joining us as we slummed our way through Europe and we didn't stay in real hotels we stayed in youth hostels and we slept up in the loft and this was high cuisine back in the early beginnings of Rick Steves Europe back when we were called Europe through the back door and many people who say we should have been called Europe through the gutter. But we've evolved from those hardy backpacker beginnings and we still have the fun, we still have the experiential youthful approach, but now we know how to do it as adults in a safe and sane way and still give you the magic of traveling as a kid around here. That's tomorrow. It's a fun talk. I'm gonna 
show you how I learned how to yodel. I'm going to take you back to the very, very beginnings when I was slumming around Europe. And we'll give you a little behind the scenes look at how we run our business. That's tomorrow at this same time, six o'clock in Seattle, nine o'clock on the East Coast. And then on Tuesday, we're going to Portugal. On Wednesday, Cameron joins us with Cullen and Cullen joins us from Scotland. And every day until the end of the month, we are celebrating Europe with you. Thank you so much. And David, what a delight to be with you. And um, I appreciate you getting up so well in the middle of your night. And now we've got a few travelers that I would imagine have questions for you. Lisa, what's going on? Oh, we have many great questions. Um, the first one comes from actually three or four people. Um, they would like to know more about the process of making your nocino. <laughs> okay. Well, nocino is like uh, any other liqueur. So you take four or five good sized walnuts uh, when they're not ripe yet. And then you basically you let them cook in the alcohol and the sugar for days and days. There are different recipes, um, but you can find it online. Go N O C I N O Nocino um, recipe online, and that will that, that will tell you exactly. And you can choose which one you prefer. The way I do it, I took I take four or five of these walnuts and I let them macerate for many many days into the alcohol and sugar uh the whole walnut with the with even with the shell and the shell of the shell so mm. it has to come from uh, green from the plant you know david how you... Long? sorry uh, i would say the whole process takes about a month to a month and a half but then i know some people that do it longer they want it stronger you know this uh, david you sound like such a renaissance man when you talk about making your walnut liqueur and but i gotta say that's not unusual in italy people in no. italy they love to make beautiful gourmet things and there's always something going on and this person could be the least likely um you know doing magic in the in the in the kitchen but you guys are always making great stuff you just know how to embrace life and live so well and it's an inspiration yeah well you know it comes from it's it's a generational thing it passes generation to generation so when you're a kid you see your grandfather making noshino 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 and you cannot drink it yet yeah so at some point you taste it when you're like 10 maybe with some water and then you're like wow this is great and then you want to learn it and then you want to learn it well then your Good. grandfather passes because life goes on and we all get old and then you pass it to the next generation so now my nephew Carlos is already learning how to make wine He's nine years old. It's beautiful. That's fantastic. Uh, let's see. So Ramona had a quick question. Do the Buteri use livestock guardian dogs? No, they don't. They uh, use horses. The 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 Butero, the Butero, the cowboy called Butero rides horses, and the horses have to be very big, strong, but fast at the same time. And they control the ca the cattle. It's wild cattle. Remember, it's not uh, it's not living in just. They live in the woods, so they're they're da they're dangerous. And uh, no, they, they don't use any dogs. They have dogs for a company, but not not for managing the cattle. Thank you, um, Rick. This one is for you. Sandra has a friend who recommended that she visit Bologna, but there's no info in your Italy book. How come? Well, you know, there's a lot of great places in Italy that we do not even say the word in our Italy book. This is uh, this book is it's quite a few chapters are ripped out of it now, but it's 1,200 pages. And it doesn't talk about Torino, it doesn't talk about Genova, it doesn't talk about Campania, it doesn't talk about the Marche, it doesn't talk about Corsica, or Sardinia. And what we do is, I decided a long time ago, Americans have the shortest vacations in the rich world. I'm going to write a book for people who are going to Italy and have a month or less. So in my estimate, from my experience, this is the book that covers the best first month in Italy. But if you want to go more deeply, there are other guidebooks that are not generalists like me, but specific experts on regions, and you could get that guidebook. But I was trying to help the most people with the, um, with the best information, and we're able to give deeper coverage here, and we're able to update it more carefully than any other book in print because we're select that way. And we're very straight with people that there's a lot of great stuff in Italy that we don't even do. But if you've got less than a month in Italy, in my judgment and my responsibility as a travel writer is to cut through the superlatives 
And not to say you can spend a lifetime in Florence. Well, of course you can spend a lifetime in Florence. I love it too, but I'm an American. I got 1.5 days. Now, how am I going to use them? You see, that's what this book does. And uh, consequently, it's um, deep coverage on my favorite places, totally skipping other places. And David, you would understand that because there's a lot of your places that you really like that don't get covered in here. And people Totally should- agreed. Yeah. yeah. It's impossible. It, it's really... I don't say this because I'm Italian and I'm from the center of the country, but it's really impossible for me as a citizen of Italy to see the whole thing. Every day I can go to a new place. It's it's so densely populated of incredible. Yeah. Cameron, my good buddy Cameron, I mentioned he's one of our writers. He just visited Trieste. I would love to include yeah. Trieste in the book. Um, I, I know Bologna. Bologna is probably the, Lisa, Pro, Bologna is probably the the biggest, re, not regret, the, the biggest, um, the next on deck if i had another 20 pages i would put that in here but i remember when i did that first research round i had been doing a lot of tours myself around italy trying different places with my groups you know we used to go to arezzo we used to go to perugia i don't like those compared to volterra and uh, orvieto so we, there's no arezzo and there's no perugia in here there's not even toddy toddy t-o-d-i and i really wanted yeah. it because i could call it hot toddy but um it didn't make it into <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. That was great. I thought we were all holding up our Italy guidebooks at the same time. So oh, that's kind of nice. Let's I get grabbed mine. We all have them. I have it here too. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Hey, wow. Salute to good travel. Mamma mia. Yeah. Mm. All right, Lisa, a couple more questions. Okay. So you actually answered the one about what would be on deck if you could put something else in the book. So, um, Jonathan is staying in San Gimignano for seven nights. Does it make sense or is it convenient for him to day trip to the Cinque Terre? You're asking me? I'm asking either one of you. Go for it, David. Yeah, you you can. You can. Uh, San Gimignano, you need definitely need a car to yeah, get def- to the closest train. Best would be to drive directly towards the Cinque Terre park outside of the Cinque Terre, like in La Spezia, mm-hmm. and then st- catch the train for the day. I'll tell you, if you're in San Gimignano in season between May and September, it's a zoo in the middle of the day. It's hot and it's crowded with with overwhelming tour groups. Um, If you're there in peak season and you want to enjoy it, be there early or be there late. It's amazing how touristy is at lunch. If you go there for dinner and then walk around after dinner, it's a different world. I love it, even in tourist times. And I was just there uh, last month in December. It was magical, San Gimignano. But it really suffers because it's so famous and it's the classic hill town with all the towers, you know. So um, I think seven days there is uh, probably six days too long. Uh, but you could use it as a springboard and, and travel around from there, as David said, if you had a car. Yeah, if you live early in the morning, about, I just checked on the maps, two hour and 15 minute drive, make it 2.30 if you want to drive safe more safely not like italians drive like like americans drive you want to drive uh so keep the ride and be quiet that's the best way to go uh get to la spezia park and if you leave at 6 7 a.m you're in la spezia 9 30 a.m in the morning you've got the whole day in cinque terre by 5 p.m go back to your car and and drive back to san gimignan doable sounds good doable okay um david Umbria and Tuscany, what's the difference and who's got better food? Uh, well, of and course. And Orvieto is Umbria, right? <laughs> yeah, Orvieto <laughs> is Umbria. I'm biased. Uh, Orvieto is Umbria, but Orvieto has a unique feature. We're, bet- we're among three regions. We're 10-minute drive from Tuscany, 10-minute drive from Lazio, the region of Rome, but we're politically speaking in Umbria. So we take, I have to say, we take the best out of the three regions. Umbria and Tuscany, both amazing food-wise. Um, if you like, if you like sausages, cold cuts, Italian deli, Umbria is one of the capital regions. That's where we invented the norcineria art to make sausages and dried meat. Wild uh, but boar, game, 
kind of game, game wild boar yes yes and doesn't definitely. a heavy wine go with that a corposo wine with the certo. yes in fact the reds that we have in umbria mm -hmm. that are less famous than the tuscan reds of course mm -hmm. and that, that we're happy about it because we keep the good wine for ourselves um sagrantino di montefalco pairs incredibly sagrantino well. that's my favorite wine i was in yeah. assisi yeah. it was assisi i think yeah and i was loving my sagrantino and i said to the guy this is like the Brunello di Montalcino of Umbria. And he said, oh, no, Brunello di Montalcino is the Sagrantino of Tuscany. Yeah, of course. Umbrian proud, pride. Yes. That's it. But, but anyway, yeah, we have very high quality food, less popular, therefore probably less expensive in the international market. If you buy a good bottle of Sagrantino, you might spend 35. If you buy a good bottle of Brunello, you might spend 50, you know, so... Sagrantino, remember that when you're in Umbria. Yes. Okay. Both, both amazing, though. I have to say, both amazing regions for food oh, yeah. and many other reasons. All right, last question. And David, this is for you, and I, I think I know what you're going to say, so I'm pretty excited. Um, Priya asks, she's going to Italy at Christmas time. Is it feasible to visit the countryside, and is it feasible to do it with just a train? What area is great for Christmas? <laughs> well, my town, Orvieto, is great for Christmas because on top of the holiday festivities and celebrations, we have uh, the Umbria Jazz Winter Festival. I have a cup with the Umbria Jazz logo here, right here. Right. It's a five-day amazing uh, festival of, of music, not only jazz, also swing and blues. And uh, so the town becomes like another place. Already a magic place becomes really incredible. And it's on the main railroad track uh, line from between Rome and Florence. So in an hour you're in Rome, in two hours you're in Florence. Nice. I would remind people that they, if they're curious about Christmas or Easter in any of these countries, they can go to the website and look at the Rick Steves special on European Christmas and European Easter. We featured Italy, and I think Italy is probably the only country that got to be in both of those shows. Uh, and uh, when I'm thinking about Christmas in Italy, I think Presepi, uh, all the communities take great, great pride in their manger scenes. And you'll see in the Cinque Terre, you've got a whole mountainside that's a a kind of a, a a beautiful manger scene. I was just in Rome at the Vatican uh, before Christmas, and you've got a, a life-size manger scene there, which is amazing, you can imagine there. And also remember in Italy that the season doesn't finish until Epiphany on January 6th. And there's a, just like we have Santa Claus that brings all the gifts, they have a, you have La Bufana, right? And this Bufana, is the, yes. the, the witch. And the witch, the witch. Is, comes on January 6th. And if you like the whole Christmas market scene in, in Bavaria, you would like uh, the, the Christmas markets that last all the way until La Bafana, at least I found in Rome. So there's festivities going, Christmas-like festivities, until the 12 days of Christmas are finished. Correct. And, and uh, if you want to catch the train, you can get into Naples and see the finest of oh. the Presepe and Nativity creations. You can go up to the Dolomites area and the Alpine villages where they have incredible markets, like Christmas markets. Mm -hmm. And along the way, you can go to Arezzo. They have the oldest uh, antique tra uh, fair uh, of Italy. And, and around the holidays, it's just amazing. And they're all around along the main uh, railroad line. I would remind people that Italy is so popular, it is so popular, and it is so hot in the summer. If you can bundle up and go off season, I think you're doing yourself a big favor. It's usually blue weather, it can be very cold, but it doesn't really get um, socked in like you might find in a lot of uh, drearier climates, and uh, it just gets bitter cold, but you don't have any of the crowds off season, and it's just a, a easier time and uh, very rewarding. I, David, I want to thank you again for joining us. and. Uh, I wish I could have a sip of your uh, walnut liqueur, but why don't you take a sip of it for us here and I'll sip my uh, spritz. Salute. Salute, my friend. And I hope you get a good night's sleep. Lisa, thank you very much. And I want to remind everybody, we're right here, same time, same station for the rest of the month. And tomorrow night is a special episode. It's a very candid, um, almost embarrassing look at our rough beginnings here at Rick Steves Europe and how we have grown from a little gang of backpackers slumming around Europe to a company of a hundred. Um, I'm so thankful for my staff. We have a hundred great uh, colleagues like Lisa here in Seattle and 150 guides like David in Europe and together 
We write the best-selling guidebooks in the United States for Europe. We create the most magnificent TV series and radio series in public broadcasting. And I'm very proud and thankful for the fact that we get to take 30,000 Americans around Europe every year on a thousand different tours, 40 itineraries, all thanks to my staff here and our great guides like David in Europe. Thank you very much. Thanks again, David. And happy travels to everybody. Ciao. Ciao, grazie.